Thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction, Yvonne. And thanks to Drexel, thanks to Anna and your team. This has been an extraordinary meeting and really is emblematic of what a great institution Drexel uh, is and is becoming and uh, how exciting this field is. And you've captured that very, very well. Well, the, uh, the title of today's session is something like the title of the Gauguin painting that I have on the screen there. It's really a chance for us to reflect on where the field is, where we've come over recent years, and where we are going in coming years. So it's, it's really a, a lot of fun to be in this session, and it's an honor to do it alongside the, the other individuals who will be up on the stage in a few minutes. So um, I, it's fun to look back over where the field has come in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. In 2003, a special issue of the American Journal of Public Health, shown here, was dedicated to the built environment and health. I had the chance to edit that issue together with two friends and colleagues, Dick Jackson and Andy Dannenberg. So 10 years later, in 2013, we uh, took advantage of the 10th birthday to do a survey of where the field had come in the 10 years since that special issue. And it, it, it had a um, hopefully not too self-congratulatory a tone. I don't mean congratulating ourselves, but congratulating our field for where we had come. And we found that there had been amazing progress. Uh, if you just looked at publications, uh, searching on the terms built environment and health, we had gone from just 39 papers in the previous decade to uh, 675 papers in the decade from 2003 to 2013, meaning that scholarly discussions of the built environment and health were probably the only phenomenon that was actually progressing faster than urban change in the world. Uh, university training had geared up. There were courses at that point at 21 universities and joint programs and planning and public health at 14 universities. Those numbers have both increased since 2013. We just had our joint degree program uh, at University of Washington officially approved last week, I'm glad to say. Organizational activities. Now, those of you on the planning and design side won't recognize the first few initials, the American Public Health Association. ASTO is the Association of uh, State Health Departments and NACHO of Local Health Departments. The American Planning Association, market-based groups such as the Urban Land Institute, uh, the American Institute of Architects, all have uh, robust activities at the intersection of health and the built environment. So a lot of action there, very good guidelines being published, uh, very authoritative documents coming out. And we have a series of books now. Some of them are designed for use as classroom textbooks and some of them just for general reading. But there is th the things that would make a field a field have actually emerged uh, robustly in the last decade or so. A lot of scientific advances, and I have to say these were splendidly on display yesterday with the sessions at this meeting. The uh, innovative data sources quickly deploying uh, social media and instrumentation in the service of research on health in the built environment. Multi-level analysis, Ana diaz Ru is one of the pioneers of, of this kind of data analysis. The complex system modeling that we heard about yesterday. So our, our methodology has advanced quite a bit in recent years. And on the ground where it really counts, we're seeing the market moving. We're seeing more demand for the kinds of product that we all think are, is healthy. Uh, this is an ad from the Metro in DC advertising to young individuals that you can actually buy an apartment. I think this was in Arlington, Virginia. And, and the real appeal of the apartment was that you could walk from the metro to your apartment in just a few minutes, in less time than it takes to uh, drink that macchiato and eat that pastry from Starbucks. So it was, of course, really nice to see that the market is advertising walkability and transit use and so on although I did the algebra on that particular transaction. So if you walk 10 minutes and drink a macchiato and eat a pastry, there's a net gain of about 300 calories. <laughs> so the, the, the health calculation hasn't been fully realized here. Um, and we're seeing policy changes. We're seeing changes in zoning. We're seeing changes in building codes so that the, the, the construction of healthy habitats for people is becoming less illegal in many places. And that's all for the good. So we've made a lot of progress. There's a lot to celebrate. And I hope that there is a celebratory tone to much of our meeting, because there is a lot to celebrate. However, we do have some challenges. I've identified uh, six of what I think are these challenges. And I'll just discuss those for the next few minutes and then really look forward to our discussion about these. Uh, the first is the question of outcomes. An interesting reflection on our field is that so much of it has been driven by a focus on physical activity. This is a little bit reminiscent of the field of toxicology in the years after Rachel Carson published Silent Spring in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. 
What was the main health outcome that toxicologists worried about during all those years? It was cancer. Uh, all of risk assessment is based on cancer. A lot of the research funding in toxicology went to cancer. And you might reasonably ask the question, why was cancer at the center of things? We know that neurologic development, that endocrine function, that lots of other things are affected by toxic chemicals. So historically, what was it that put cancer at the center? Turned out there was a good reason. The American Cancer Society was a highly effective advocacy organization. Cancer is not an uncommon disease. And between the, the, the uh, commonness of the disease and the very effective advocacy, a lot of the funding went to cancer, and that became the centerpiece. In retrospect, we may have been a little imbalanced, not paying enough attention to pediatric neurological development, endocrine function, and so on. Similarly, in the built environment and health space, a lot of the focus has been on physical activity. Now, that's not unreasonable. We have an obesity epidemic, and sedentary lifestyles don't help with that. But a lot of the reason for that probably relates to the advocacy by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the funding. Uh, they've been the major funding source of research in this area in the notable absence of federal government funding, to which I'll return. And so that has given our field a particular character. Now, that's not all we've done. People have also looked at air quality, at social capital, uh, to a lesser extent at car crashes, uh, to a lesser extent at mental health. And these are all outcomes that we know are linked with the built environment. But one wonders, have we got the right portfolio of outcomes uh, at, as the uh, subjects of our research, or can we do better? Uh, you all know the World Health Organization definition of health, and it's a reminder, as if we needed one, that health is much broader than just the absence of disease, but it's um, complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It would be ideal if we had a research agenda and we implemented the results of the research in ways that maximized complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease along those specific outcomes that we've been studying. In fact, I would argue that we should go even more broad than that. This is the Declaration of Independence, which is nice to be reminded of here in Philadelphia, a historic city. It speaks of life, liberty, and the pursuit of, right, it's not property, it's not sexual gratification, it's happiness. Now that's important. What about happiness? Should we be aiming for happiness? Well, um, happiness has been discussed a lot in recent years. Here's a dog who's in an ideal built environment, and he says to his friend, I've got the bowl, the bone, the big yard. I know I should be happy. You've probably all seen the research showing that even as our country has propelled itself into great prosperity in the last 50 years, the level of average happiness uh, or self-reported well-being, a related concept, uh, has not increased at all. So what's going on, and should we care? Well, there's a huge field of happiness studies, hedonic psychology, well-being studies, which is a related concept. And these all can be deconstructed a lot. But I think we would all agree that it's better for people to be happy than not to be happy. And although physical activity is good, not being obese is good, reducing your risk of a car crash is good, wouldn't it be interesting if our outcome were a general sense of happiness and well-being distributed as broadly as possible across the population? That would be the sign of a thriving population. And if we knew how to create built environments in ways that propelled us in that direction, that would be a good thing. It's relevant to health. It's not a separate domain from health. People who are happier are healthier, and people who are healthier are happier. So this is uh, quite directly relevant to the, uh, the uh, central topic of today's meeting. Let me show you uh, some evidence suggesting that the built environment does play a role in happiness. Uh, on the y-axis here is the outcome life satisfaction, the people's answer to the question, in general, how satisfied are you with your life? On the x-axis is the quality of life ranking, which relates a lot to the built environment. So the components include access to waterways, parks, air quality, commute time, very much features of the built environment. On a state-by-state -state level, when you compare the um, quality of life ranking with life satisfaction, there's actually quite a strong association. Something about the places we live predicts and affects our level of happiness and life satisfaction. In fact, there's an emerging literature suggesting that we can design and build places in ways that help promote people's happiness and well-being. So the subject of today's meeting, urban health, 
uh, even if we define health broadly, may not be broad enough. And it, it's ironic for me, my job is the public health point of view in this morning's session, but I want to argue now that we should actually think beyond health to a broader set of outcomes. Second, the scope of urban health. Now, this is an interesting uh, discourse within our field. What is urban health? The topic of today's uh, meeting. Well, one whole tradition holds that urban health is about the health of deprived people living in cities. This kind of has a, a, a set of origins in the degradation of cities several decades ago with, with white flight out of cities and the concentration of poverty in cities and the diseases of poverty, which became the centerpiece of the urban health field. And to this day, if you look at the Journal of Urban Health, much of the content looks like this. On the other hand, a lot of the so-called built environment and health discourse that I've been referring to in the last few minutes has more to do with uh, walkability, density, the features of urban design that, that we think may make cities better places to live and healthier places to live. Well, of course, this is a false distinction. Uh, we need to look at both things, the social determinants of health on the left, the physical design features that make places healthier and allow people to thrive, and critically, and I'll return to this, we need to take the social awareness that is intrinsic on the left and bring that into design discussions on the right to fuse these two. So urban health really needs to be considered both the social determinants of health field and the design field, one with very much a public health genealogy and one with a genealogy in the design professions. But there's another scope issue as well. Now, I've talked about the health, the well-being, happiness piece, the standard human outcomes, but I'd argue that as we design great places in which people can thrive, there are other parts of our scope that we need to take into account as well. Even as people are moving back into cities and as urban form is changing, one of the most important uh, concurrent changes is climate change, uh, global environmental change, the degradation of ecosystems, and the compelling need for us to switch from the way we've been doing business for the last few centuries to the post-carbon economy. We can't be designing cities unless we're keeping that very much in mind. So the end game is not just healthy places, but it's green, sustainable, healthy places. That has to be part of our scope, and yet we're, we're peeling off too small a piece if we only look at human outcomes. In the meantime, uh, climate change poses immediate risks to cities. Many of those risks are concentrated in cities, the heat waves, for example. So we need to be thinking about resiliency, emergency preparedness, and response and recovery. And we can't be about designing places such as cities unless we're baking that into our design thinking as well. The third category I want to talk about is aesthetics. Now, this is uh, touchy ground to get on. Aesthetics is a very subjective issue, and I would never pretend to tell you what you should think looks nice. Um, but the built environment and health field has become rather biomedical. We frame our research in the language of hypothesis testing. We, we find ourselves attracted to measurable, quantifiable outcomes. And as we move in that direction of biomedicalizing our research, we may lose the discussion of aesthetics, which is actually a central discussion to the design professions, and those of us in public health are not quite so good at talking about it. Now, while I wouldn't claim to dictate what looks good, it's pretty clear that there are ugly, degrading, corrosive scenes all the time in many of our cities and towns, and that these can't be good for people to have to endure day in, day out. In fact, there's only one response to places like this, and it, it invites us in the health fields to think about whether we can somehow capture the aesthetic dimension of, of people's existence in the built environment and to help make people's lives better, maybe even healthier, uh, if we can address the aesthetics. <clears throat> the fourth is the question of distributive justice. This has come up uh, in our discussion over the last two days, and in fact, this is a, a common theme in the urban health literature, but it has to be right at the heart of what we do. As cities change their form, as real estate values in cities rise, as gentrification progresses, and as people are pushed out of where they live, um, we need to address that. In fact, if we were to identify the two or three most important social and environmental trends in our country and in our world right now, the growing income inequality would have to be one of those trends. So can we uh, integrate into our built environment and health agenda addressing those inequities addressing the health inequities that result from them and creating a world that is a better place for everybody. The next is pipelines. Uh, thanks. 
We have more training programs than ever. It's more possible than ever if you're a student of planning or architecture to learn some public health principles, and it's more possible if you're a health student to learn about the design professions. But what do you do for a living when you finish? The kinds of jobs that Keith has, working in healthy places in a planning agency or in a public health agency, are not common enough. So we need to be thinking about the ways that our students who are going to be better trained than we ever were and who are going to be very skilled at achieving healthy places can actually put that expertise to work. That means that planning agencies, transportation agencies, health agencies, private development firms need to see the value of hiring people who are cross-trained and to put those people to work. So that remains a challenge for us. And lastly is the question of implementation. We have learned a lot through our research. We still have a lot to learn, but we know a lot about how to make places that are healthy and in which people can thrive. So now we need to uh, go from what we know to what we should do, fill that no-do gap. And I want to discuss that on two levels. The, the subtitle of this meeting is Research and Action. So let's talk about each. On the research side, one of our persisting problems is that there is such a scarcity of funding for research on the built environment and health. The largest biomedical funder in the country, in fact in the world, is the National Institutes of Health. It funds virtually nothing in this area. Over on the built environment side, on the physical world side, the National Science Foundation is the predominant funder. They don't get into the health arena. So we have a funding gap that's been filled to some extent by foundations and private sources, to some extent by repurposed uh, money from the federal funders, but we really need a more robust agenda so that important questions that haven't yet been answered can be answered by the research community. This is a picture of the recent invitation from the NIH to comment on the NIH strategic plan. How many people submitted comments? So I see one hand up in the audience. It was Daniel, two hands, Anna did, I did, three of us. And this is indicative of the fact that many of us probably are very comfortable bemoaning the lack of research funding, but when it actually comes to taking steps to change the research agenda and have funding directed in this area, not enough of us have been active. The uh, comment period has closed, so uh, if I've made you feel badly not to have submitted a comment, sorry about that. But um, there is still time to work on changing research funding priorities and to help the agencies understand the importance and the value of research in this area. When we get results from research, we need to put those into action. That's the implementation step. Uh, we need to see streets that are better streets, uh, buildings that are better buildings with healthier materials in them, uh, transit systems that serve people more effectively, and staircases that seduce people into taking the stairs instead of the elevators. All of those things on the ground need to be implemented, and that means that we should be thinking a lot about translation of our research into practice and incorporation of the design, build, develop, maintain communities uh, into the work that we do as academics. So uh, I'm very pleased to report that we have made great progress in the last 10 years in the built environment and health agenda. I think we really should take a moment to celebrate that. But at the same time, it's important to remember that we have a lot to do. I've uh, suggested six areas in which we have a lot to do, and uh, I think we'll do it. I am very optimistic that because of the work of the expert people in this room and our colleagues who aren't here, we will have safer, healthier, more sustainable, more just habitats for humans going forward. Thank you very much.